uh, as you probably all know, we have a visiting speaker from Brooklyn Bethel, Brother Lee Waters, and I'd like to invite Brother Waters up here now, and he's going to talk to us on the theme, Look, Jehovah's Slave Girl. Brother Waters? Of all the women who have walked the earth, none have been the objects of more attention, affection, and adulation than the Jewish virgin who gave birth to the Son of God, Mary. Mary has been hailed, invoked, implored with almost fanatical fervor by Roman Catholics. Typical is the view expressed by one Catholic cardinal who said, Mary is the gate of heaven because no one can enter that blessed kingdom without passing through her. At the command of Mary, all obey, even God. Imagine that. Well, spurred on by their leaders, it's no surprise that the Catholic laity has been known to indulge in acts of gushing emotionalism when it comes to Mary. And in this, there is both irony and tragedy, because in venerating Mary, they've come to know neither the true God, who is loving and merciful and gracious, nor have they come to know the woman Mary that they venerate. For their image of Mary is a haloed plaster saint a serenely impassive creature that perpetually suckles an infant is totally contrary to the picture that God's Word paints of her. The Bible portrays Mary as a living, vibrant woman. It is a portrait that glows with faith and humility. It is the portrait of a woman who saw herself not as the Queen of Heaven or as the Gate of Heaven, but as a lowly slave girl. Now, this quality of Mary makes her very special to Jehovah's people. Someone that was willing to slave for God. Because this idea of slaving for God continues to be a stumbling block to millions of people. Millions of people have been contacted by Jehovah's Witnesses, and many of them believe we have the truth. They've attended our meetings, they like us as an organization. But when they become aware of the fact that they'll have to knock on doors and slave for God, they're turned off. And millions more have actually dedicated their lives as witnesses of Jehovah. But yet, after coming up out of the water of baptism and having made a solemn dedication, many proceed to slave, not for God, but for jobs, but for material possession, for fame, for glory, and they call themselves witnesses of Jehovah. Well, the example of Mary, this humble slave of God, should motivate all of us to take a good look at our lives and to see what slaving for God really entails. Let's therefore paint a portrait of this Jewish woman, Mary. It is the year 2 BCE. The foot of the Roman Empire rests on the nation of Israel. And people pray for deliverance. They pray for a Messiah. Ah, but they expect that Messiah to be a politician, a leader of men, someone that will remove them from the Roman yoke. So men of faith wait for some kind of trumpet blast that their deliverance is near. Well, true to expectation, an announcement did come, but it was not a vulgar trumpet cry, nor was the announcement made to the nation's pious scribes or Pharisees, nor to its political activists nor even to the Levites who serve daily in the temple of God. No. The announcement of the arrival of the Messiah was made to a poor, unlettered virgin girl named Mary. We open our Bibles now to Luke chapter 1, verse 26. And here it says, In her sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent forth from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin promised in marriage to a man named Joseph of David's house. And the name of the virgin was Mary. And that is all the information we have about this woman other than her genealogy. We know nothing about how she looked, how tall she was, what her build or figure was, the color of her hair. But we do know this, she must have been one remarkable woman. And why do we say that? Because Jehovah God was about to entrust her with the most precious possession in the entire universe, his son. We read in verse 28, 
And when he, Gabriel, went in before her, he said, Good day, highly favored one. Jehovah is with you. Now, just having an angel appear would be upsetting enough. And then to be told that she was highly favored and that Jehovah was with her in some special sense, that must have deeply disturbed this young girl. Verse 29 says, But she was deeply disturbed at the same, and began to reason out what sort of greeting this might be. As Mary was well aware of her genealogy. She knew she was of the line of David. And she knew that through that line of David would come the Messiah, the King, the Christ. And the thought that it could be her must have been a very upsetting thing emotionally. Well, sensing her upset, the angel says in verse 30, So the angel said to her, Have no fear, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And look, you will conceive in your womb and give birth to a son, and you are to call his name Jesus. This one will be great and will be called Son of the Most High, and Jehovah will give him the throne of David his father. And he will rule as king over the house of Jacob forever. And there will be no end to his kingdom. Ah, yes, these were exciting words. Yes, the Messiah would come through her. There would be a king coming through her. But look at verse 31. What did it mean? You will conceive in your womb. Yes, you, this young, unmarried girl, will become pregnant and have a baby. We can only imagine what fears, what questions, what anxieties went through the mind of this young girl. A baby, carrying a baby, nursing the baby, changing the baby. Why, any plans that Mary might have had in her mind as to what she was going to do with the rest of her life suddenly were blown to the dream. Now she'd have a big project on her hands. And to make matters worse, she was not married. Why, having an infant out of wedlock would ruin her life. She was engaged, no doubt deeply in love with Joseph. How would she explain it to him? Would he believe it? And most frightening of all, as an engaged virgin, were she to be found pregnant, it even put her in line to be executed by being stoned to death. Yes, we can only imagine the fears and anxieties Mary felt. How would she react? Well, verse 34 says, But Mary said to the angel, How is this to be? Notice she doesn't say, This can't be. How can it happen? She didn't question God's power. How is this to be? Since I am having no intercourse with a man. Well, this was long before the days that men had a little insight into genetics and the all of the things such as cloning and surrogate motherhood, which help us begin to understand how such a thing could be possible. No, the angel didn't give her a lesson in genetics. He simply says this in verse 35. Then answer, the angel said to her, Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. For that reason, also, what is born will be called Holy, God's Son. Well, still the mind asks how, how. It's nice to know Holy Spirit would do this, but faith was involved. And that's why in verse 37, the angel puts it this way. Because with God, no declaration will be an impossibility. Don't worry about how this is to happen. God has said it's going to happen. Do you believe it? Well, you might ask yourself what you would have done were you placed in the position of man. Because sooner or later, tests of faith come, opportunities come up. And very often, when theocratic privileges or opportunities are laid before us, how quickly we beg off. How quickly we say, well, I sure wish I could do that. I wish I could pioneer, but you know, I have bad health. Or, you know, I, I wish I could serve at Bethel, but that's so far away. I wish I could serve as a ministerial servant or elder, but you know, I have a family to care for. Yes, how often we are prone to come up with excuses. Well, certainly, Mary was in a position to come up with some very valid excuses. Hey, look what you're asking me to do. You're asking me to ruin my life, risk my engagement, risk even being executed. But no, that was not the inclination of Mary. 
Mary soon shows that God had made a very wise choice. Her answer is recorded in verse 38. Then Mary said, Look, Jehovah's slave girl. Now, no more eloquent words have ever been spoken by a woman. Look, Jehovah's slave girl. How simple. But how meaningful those simple words. In effect, Mary was saying, Jehovah, I don't know how this is going to work out. I don't know how you're going to do this. I don't know how it's going to affect my life, but I do know this. I am confident that submission to you, Jehovah, will never bring me harm. I am your slave. And that's why Mary then said, May it take place with me according to your declaration. At that, the angel departed from her. Yes, Mary was willing to slave, to give herself completely to the will of God, put aside any personal ambition she might have had. Her faith was unquestioned. And when Mary uttered those simple, modest words, you know what happened? One of the greatest miracles of history took place. If you could have been up in heaven, you would have seen it. For at that instant of time, the Logos, the Son of God, Michael, disappeared from heaven. He disappeared from heaven and by means of the Holy Spirit, that life force, that personality, was implanted into the womb of Mary. Holy Spirit came upon her as the angel explained, verse 35. The Holy Spirit would overshadow her. Evidently, that Holy Spirit worked upon that egg in Mary's womb and fertilized it and then started canceling out any imperfection in that fertilized egg. No doubt Jehovah retained some of those genetic characteristics so that the baby conceived in her womb would look like her. But all the imperfection would be gone. And then that Holy Spirit, as the angel explained, would overshadow her and surround her like a wall. She would not have to fear a spontaneous abortion or miscarriage or that Satan could bring some harm to that embryo. No, Jehovah would protect it. No damage could be done to it because she had humbled herself and made herself available for Jehovah's service. Well, very often we find that when people are given large privileges, sometimes they change. Sometimes that humble person starts thinking a lot of himself or herself. And we have to wonder how the privilege of being made miraculously pregnant would affect the thinking of this young woman. Well, verse 39 says, Mary rose in those days and went into the mountainous country with haste to a city of Judah. Well, why? Was she running away from a problem? Not at all. Verse 40 says she entered into the home of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth, her relative. Yes, Elizabeth was no doubt an older woman, and this uh, was a chance for her to talk matters over. Many of our sisters today do that. When they have a problem, they might find an older, mature sister in the congregation and talk out the problem. Well, Elizabeth was thrilled. Verse 40 shows that as Mary walks in, Elizabeth called out with a loud cry and said, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. Well, that was true. She was in a blessed position. And how easy it would be now for Mary to start thinking, Oh, I'm, I'm somebody special. Maybe when I walk into a room, people should say, Hail Mary. But that wasn't to be the case. No, again in verse 46, Mary shows the same willingness to slave for Jehovah. Look at what she said. And Mary said, My soul magnifies Jehovah. No, she wouldn't accept any adulation or praise. Her slavery to Jehovah brought glory not to herself, but to the God in heaven. This helps us, therefore, look at our motives. Sometimes brothers are very upset when privileges of service aren't given them, when they're not allowed perhaps to give instruction talks or hour talks. We sometimes have to ask ourselves, who are we trying to glorify? Are we interested in glorifying ourselves? But can we honestly say that our motive is like that of Mary, simply to magnify Jehovah? Now in her following words, Mary demonstrates something. She gives a marvelous speech, a marvelous little poem, you might call it, that magnifies or glorifies Jehovah. 
And were you to study those verses all the way down to verse 56, and were you to take those chain references in your Bible, it would absolutely astound you. There's a little study project for you. Study out those chain references one evening. You know why? Because those few Bible verses there reveal something about Mary. She must have been some student of God's Word. Why, that little speech shows a knowledge of 1 Samuel chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, because the speech is modeled after the speech that Hannah made, after Jehovah blessed her with the privilege of giving birth to a Samuel. She evidently knew the Psalms. She knew the historic books of the Bible. There are references to the Proverbs. There are references to Malachi chapter 3. On and on, Mary cites Scripture. Well, now we know why Jehovah chose her as his slave girl. Evidently, Mary had spent much time in personal study. She had gone to the synagogue regularly. She had listened. She studied God's word, and she knew it and could quote it. Well, brothers, we ask this question. What is it that motivates a person to want to forsake full-time work, take up part-time work, make the economic sacrifice, knock on doors full-time? Do you know what often it is? Personal study. That's what it is. It's not somebody harassing them and making them feel guilty. You should be out there pioneering that personal study, getting to know God's Word. When we read the Bible and study God's Word, that motivates us. What is it that helps people in full-time service, or brothers serving as elders and ministerial servants, what helps them stay in their privileges? Personal study. Reading God's Word, motivating oneself. And conversely, why do brothers sometimes step down as elders, step down as ministerial servants, drop off the pioneer list? Often it's simply because they've allowed their personal study but well, we learned something from this. If we want to be in a position for Jehovah to use us for special privileges in the congregation, there are no shortcut bro cut brothers. We have to study. What a fine example Mary said. Of course, simply studying God's word is not all there is to being a slave of God. Mary was soon to learn that if she had any illusions of glory left, those illusions would soon be dashed. Three months passed, and now Mary became rather visibly pregnant. And she had to face probably one of the most difficult situations she would ever face. And you know what it was? She had to approach her fiancé, Joseph, and tell him. She had to tell him that she was pregnant and that that pregnancy was miraculous, that an angel would come, had come to her. Do you think he'd believe that? No doubt Mary wished an angel would come to her rescue and go to Joseph and take that burden off her, but the Bible doesn't indicate that that happened. Well, that marriage, if it was to work, was going to face unique pressures. They were going to be raising the Son of God, and Satan would be applying special pressures to that marriage. Well, if that marriage was to last, there had to be honesty, there had to be communication. So Mary, therefore, started marriage off on the right foot, by evidently approaching Joseph and laying it out on the line. Now, how different Mary was from some engaged couples in the congregation today. Very often, engaged couples are not honest with one another. They want to get married so bad, they'll say just about anything. I think of one situation where a, a brother said to a sister, Now, look, I'm interested in marriage, but I want a pioneer. Well, that's what I want to do. You see, what I really want to see is someone that will be a pioneer. Partner. Well, that's what I want to do. See, and they got married, but found out after a few months she really didn't want to be a pioneer partner. And oftentimes, engaged couples withhold information. They don't let the other person know that before coming in the truth, they engaged in sexual immorality. And sooner or later, that comes up in the marriage. Well, how much better it is to lay it out on the line, let this perspective mate, nobody has to know the good, the bad, the ugly, and then we're setting down communication, confiding in one another. Well, she tried, and probably as she suspected, Joseph didn't believe it. Oh, he must have been in love with her and trusted her. But even with all his love and trust to believe that an angel came down and had his fiancé believe that she was pregnant, this was too much. He couldn't believe it. 
Well, therefore, we now turn to Matthew chapter 1, verse 19. And we see how this affected him. He must have been deeply hurt by it. And here we read, however, Joseph, her husband, because he was righteous and did not want to make her a public spectacle, intended to divorce her secretly. Oh, how devastated Mary must have been. By the same token, number one, Joseph didn't have two witnesses. He couldn't accuse her of adultery because for all everyone knew, maybe he was the father of the child. And he was unlike some couples, even in the truth today, that have gone through a marital breakup and used the divorce as a means of hurting one another, as a means of punishing and humiliating one another, washing the dirty laundry in public. No, Joseph decided not to make a public spectacle, to minimize the shame and the scandal. So evidently what he had in mind was a secret divorce, giving her a certificate of divorce in front of two witnesses. That would be legal. But he never got to do that. For verse 20 says, But after he had thought these things over, look, now the angel comes to the rescue. Jehovah's angel appeared to him and told him, Joseph, don't be afraid. This is by God's hand. Go ahead and marry your fiancé Mary. Well, that ordeal of Mary was over. But soon she faced another one. Several months passed, and as physician Luke describes it, Mary became heavy with child. Now, it's true now she was in a secure marriage. But think, sisters, many of you have borne children. You know how that last month is when you are heavy with child. Suppose your husband approached you and said, Honey, I want to put you on a donkey, and we're going to travel 90 miles down to Bethlehem. How would you respond? Well, the Caesar decreed a census, evidently for taxation purposes, and he required everyone re to return to the land of their birth or the city of their birth. That meant traveling 90 miles on a donkey. Evidently, though, it wasn't simply fear of Caesar that made this very heavy Mary get up on that donkey. As a student of God's word, she must have remembered the prophecy of Micah that said that the Messiah would be born where? And so willing was she to submit herself to God's will, she just started riding all the way down there, 90 miles, to the little city of Bethlehem. When they got there, that little town of Bethlehem was not a quiet place. It was a buzz with activity. All the returning registries were there. The census officials were there. Roman soldiers must have been there. Poor Joseph, he couldn't even find a place to put his wife. What a panic he must have been in. Finally, some kindly soul directed them to an empty animal stall, and Mary goes into labor. Well, we men can well imagine how Joseph might, must have felt. Back in those days, men were not taught to help their wife have a baby. You know, these days men have classes and they go in with their wives. Not back in ancient times. You had to find a midwife. So poor Joseph must have run all over Bethlehem looking for a midwife. And presumably finding one, he would have gone outside and left the women alone. Well, after a few anxious moments, he would hear a piercing cry, and that would announce the birth of the Messiah, the Christ. In a way that no human could have predicted, Messiah was here. As John says in his gospel, the word became flesh. Not by materializing, but by a human birth. And really, once again, this was one of God's greatest miracles. For God had managed to take the personality of this heavenly creature and transferred into this little baby. But it was just a baby. You might say that the infant Jesus was like someone with amnesia. He had no heavenly memories. He was just a baby, perfect baby, but still an infant. He would need to be cared for, to be taught, to be fed. And now that reality was in Mary's arms. What would she do? Would she be up to that task? Back in ancient times, the midwife would do most of the work after the birth. She would clean up the infant, cut the navel cord. And then, interestingly, they had a nice little custom. They would take the baby and mummify him, wrap him up real tight, wrap him around his head. That was supposed to teach him to breathe through his nose. I don't know whether it worked. But they would swaddle him. And some doctors to this day recommend it as a way of helping the baby stay warm and feel very safe and secure. Yes, this was the work of the midwife. 
But a little statement in Luke chapter 2, verse 7 gives some insight into how Mary evidently felt about her responsibility of caring for this infant. Luke chapter 2, verse 7 says, And she gave birth to her son, the firstborn. And she, not the midwife, she bound him with cloth bands and laid him in a manger. Can't you just picture the midwife starting to do this customary procedure? Mary saying, no, no, let me do that. Does that not give a little bit of insight into the beautiful tender feeling she had toward this infant? She had to view that child as a gift from God. She took her job seriously. And she would lavish love and affection and attention. On this baby. Certainly, Jehovah made a very wise election here. But slaving for God meant more than changing diapers, as Mary was soon to learn. Now, in the congregation, when a sister has a baby, we all managed to show up two days later. But back in ancient times, women weren't put through that. You see, the Mosaic law required that a woman be in virtual isolation after she had a baby. Maybe some of you sisters wish we'd go back to the Mosaic law because she was considered ceremonially unclean. So after about 40 days of isolation and recuperation, Mary has to get up again and travel. Why? Well, the Mosaic Law now required her to make a five-mile trip to Jerusalem. I wonder how many women would be in the mood to make that trip. Well, she did it. She had to go to Jerusalem because she had to go to the temple and offer up a sacrifice and remove this ceremonial uncleanness. By the way, the fact that she'd have to offer up that sacrifice proves that she was no immaculate conception, as the Catholic Church says. She acknowledged the imperfection. We just read in Luke chapter 2, verse 22, Also, when the days for purifying them according to the law of Moses came to the full, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to Jehovah. Just as it is written in Jehovah's law, every male opening a womb must be called holy to Jehovah. And to offer sacrifice according to what is said in the law of Jehovah. Now, this verse is very interesting. What would they offer? A bull, very expensive. A goat, not quite as expensive, but still quite an expense. No. It says a pair of turtle doves, or two young pigeons. Brothers, do you realize that that was the sacrifice of a poor person? Very lowest thing a person could sacrifice. Evidently, Joseph and Mary were very poor. Yet they gave what they had. What little they had, they gave to Jehovah. You can be sure that Jehovah blessed them for that. Well, if like Mary, we're to be Jehovah's slaves, should we not be willing to give what we have? I was talking to some members of the Bethel family not too long ago. They were assigned out to a congregation out in a very affluent area. And our brothers traveled quite a distance to get out there. And they go out and serve it. Then there's a several hour gap until the meeting. Well, it's inconvenient to travel all the way back to Bethel. Now, you would think some kindly soul would invite them over to their house, if not for lunch, at least to have a place to park themselves. But no, these brothers find themselves sitting in McDonald's. There's no one in that congregation has ever offered their hospitality. And these are brothers that live in beautiful homes, drive expensive cars. And I couldn't help but think of a sister in my congregation who's very, very poor. But all she has is a little apartment. And over the years, she's had a unique privilege. Every Sunday, she invites all of us lights in our congregation over for lunch. She can't afford much. Sometimes it's bologna sandwiches, sometimes it's tuna fish. But you can be sure that we love that sister. Because she shares what little she has. Yes, when we share what we have, even though it's little, we're sure to get Jehovah's blessing. Even if it's little. I think two of the days when my roommate and I used to entertain people and in our early days at Bethel, when we were on a $14 a month allowance, that was years ago, all we could afford to feed our guests was the Jello and popcorn. I was thinking of the Gallegos who were sitting there who had, were subjected to some of that Jello and popcorn. But uh, we gave what we had, and we had much rich association. So, brothers, never let low financial means hinder you from sharing what you have. Well, they would go to the temple and do that. And no doubt there were dozens of couples, perhaps hundreds of couples there in the temple doing the same thing. Mary and Joseph wouldn't have stood out, but to someone they did stand out. We read in verse 25, and look, there was a man in Jerusalem named Simeon, 
And this man was righteous and reverent, waiting for Israel's consolation, and Holy Spirit was upon him. Yes, we might compare Simeon to some of you older brothers in the congregation, especially those of you who have been in the truth for many years, and you've waited for Armageddon for decades. You waited, perhaps some of you, for 1914, it didn't come, 1925, it didn't come, 1975, it didn't come, and you're still waiting and waiting. Then verse 26 says, Furthermore, it had been divinely revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Christ of Jehovah. Now, what a merciful thing it was for Jehovah to reveal this to this man. Why? Because from all human reckoning, Simeon was too old ever to see the Messiah, and he knew it. Because as a student of God's word, he would have known the 70 weeks of year prophecy said that the Messiah was to come later on, 29 CE. And he was an old man. He knew he wouldn't live those 30 years until the Messiah came. Now Jehovah says, now no, before you die, you'll get to see him. And then verse 27 says, under the power of the Spirit, he now came into the temple. And he spots this young couple. Evidently, Jehovah's Spirit says, that's them. Approach them. And as the parents brought the young child Jesus in to do for it according to the customary practice of the law, he no doubt approached them. And it says, he himself received it into his arms. The words cannot express how this old man must have felt when he took this baby into his arms. And he blessed God and said, now, sovereign Lord, you are letting your slave go free in peace, according to your declaration, because my eyes have seen your means of saving isn't that beautiful? Although he'd never lived to see the Messiah begin his ministry or to die on the torture stake, he had held in his arms the one that would save the world. Now, many older ones may not live long enough to see Armageddon. They may not live to see the Great Tribulation, and their hope may be in the resurrection. But they have lived by undeserved kindness long enough to see the installation of God's kingdom since 1914, They've seen the gathering of a great crowd, which will be the foundation of God's new order. And if some of our older ones die off before Armageddon comes, like Simeon, they can die in peace. And no doubt this was put in the Bible to encourage older ones during the last days to hold on, knowing that God's new order is near. Well, how encouraged Mary and Joseph must have been as this old man now began to speak and praise Jehovah. But then comes something very ominous. Turning to Mary, Simeon says in verse 34, Look, this one, this one is laid for the fall and the rising again of many in Israel. And for a sign to be talked against, this meant not everyone would accept the Messiah and that it would lead to the spiritual fall of many and that many would be against this infant that he held in his arms. And no doubt, looking Mary right in the eyes, he said these frightening words of verse 35. Yes. A long sword will be run through the soul of you yourself. Oh, Mary must have winced at those words. What did that mean? Mary didn't know. Just how these frightening, ominous words would be fulfilled would be something that she no doubt thought about for the next 30 years. She would ponder the meaning of those words until one day the full meaning of them would be dramatically driven home. But she knew this. Being a slave of Jehovah was not going to be easy. It was going to entail suffering, pain, sacrifice. And how many in the organization today, when it is brought to their attention that being one of Jehovah's Witnesses is more than coming to nice meetings and being with nice people, but that pain and sacrifice and even suffering might be involved, how many have been moved to say, oh, too much for me, I quit, but not Mary. No, without fully knowing what was in line for her, she did not shirk back one well, what would happen next? No, they didn't run, but for some reason they did not go back to Nazareth. Evidently, Mary and Joseph, when they left the temple, went all the way back to Bethlehem, 
and settled down. Joseph was a carpenter. There probably was plenty of work for him to do. And evidently, Jehovah prospered his business. Now, why do we say that? Because the next time we see Joseph and Mary, they're no longer in some animal stall. The Bible says they were in a house. He did pretty good for himself within a few months. Yes, weeks, months, perhaps up to two years passed in seeming security. How easy it would have been for Mary to say, well, I've got my husband, I've got my baby, I've got my house. Let me just settle back and lead a normal life. Brothers, there is no normal life for Jehovah's people. Our adversary, Satan the devil, is a roaring lion, and he soon made his move. Herod, the king of Judah, learns that the future king of Israel has been born, and he views the prophecies relating to the Messiah as a personal threat to his dynasty. So what does King Herod do? He sends some astrologers to find the Messiah. And led by a demonic star, the astrologers find Mary and Joseph. We now read in Matthew chapter 2, verse 11. Matthew 2, 11 says, And when they, the astrologers, went into the house, ah, they were in a house, they saw the young child with Mary its mother. And falling down, they did obeisance to it. They also opened their treasures and presented it with gifts, gold and frankincense and mirror. However, because they were given divine warning in a dream not to return to Herod, they withdrew to their country by another way. It's worth pausing for a moment and reflecting on how erroneous all of those nativity scenes you've seen all your life, they're all wrong. First of all, they didn't say they were three wise men or astrologers. They just said astrologers. So whether they were three, five, or twenty, the Bible doesn't say. Number two, it wasn't in a manger. The Bible clearly says that it took place while they were in a house. And our Bible chronology helps us appreciate this must have been several months, up to two years, after the birth of Jesus. So Christendom is way, way off in all those nice little Christmas scenes that you've seen. Well, what would they, that mean now? The astrologers were gone, but did that mean the threat was over? No. Verse 13, after they, the astrologers, had withdrawn, look, Jehovah's angel appeared in a dream to Joseph, saying, Get up! Take the young child and its mother and flee into Egypt and stay there until I give you word. For Herod is about to search for the young child to destroy it. Now, brothers, what would have happened if Mary had become attached to that house? What would have happened if Mary said, but Joseph, we've worked so hard for this home. And your business is doing well. And we sent the astrologers away. They won't go back to Herod. How will they ever find us? No doubt the Messiah, the Christ, would have been annihilated. But no, Mary was a slave of Jehovah. And that house, that comfortable means of life, meant nothing to her compared to the privilege of serving Jehovah. She and her husband were prepared to lead a life of sacrifice. And to protect that child, no sacrifice was too small. Once again... Mary finds herself loaded up on a donkey, making a long trip all the way down into Egypt. And brothers, hopefully we learn a powerful lesson from this. We cannot be lulled into the false security of a, quote, normal life, unquote. There is no such thing. Satan, the devil, stands ready to pull the rug out from under our lives. He's done it before. He's done it in countries such as Malawi. He'll do it again. And so we must be prepared to give up our lives if we're going to serve Jehovah. Well, their fleeing to Egypt was none too soon. When Herod realized he had been tricked, he turned that little town of Bethlehem into a scene of indescribable horror. A carnage of unprecedented magnitude. Infants under the age of two mercilessly slaughtered. But Mary and Joseph, because they were willing to act upon Jehovah's direction, safely settled down there in Egypt where they could join all the other Jews who had settled down there after the Babylonian captivity, even being able to carry on their worship in the synagogue. Now, how long they stayed down there, we don't know. But we do know that in Matthew chapter 2, verse 19, after the death of Herod, the angel appears to Joseph and in verse 20 says, Get up. 
take the young child and its mother and be on your way into the land of Israel. Finally, Joseph and Mary would no longer have to be fugitives. And they would take that long, long trek all the way up into Galilee. Now Joseph and Mary were finally in a position to settle down and build a life for their child. Now that's the issue that faces all of you here that are parents, especially some of you that have real small children. Don't you wonder, what kind of life should I build for him? What kind of environment should I build for my child? Well, certainly Jehovah God would see to it that his child would be placed in the ideal environment. Nothing would be too good for his child. So we might be curious as to what kind of life Mary and her husband Joseph would make for the young Jesus. Would Jehovah see to it that they had great wealth and could offer him all the comforts of wealth? Many parents, even in the truth today, feel this is necessary. I remember a young couple that had two small children, and they had a lovely home, nice home, several rooms, guest rooms, but it had kind of a tiny backyard. And so the mother said to me, this house is too little. No, our children, they're going to have a big backyard and a bigger house. So they went to hop up to the ears. And they purchased a house that was just short of being a mansion. It was gigantic. You needed a guided tour of the place. It had enough backyard outside to play football. It had a swimming pool. And there was one part of land set aside for tennis courts. I don't know if they ever got around to building them. And why did they go into this? Well, this was for the children. Of course, you've got to pay for this. So the mother was not in a position to go into full-time service. Now she had to get into real estate. She took on a full-time job. And so all the time we spent with them when I visited this couple, it was real estate, real estate, interest rates, consuming passion. Well, I wasn't surprised to learn some years later that neither of their two children became spiritual members of the congregation. The son is uh, all completely rejected the truth. The young daughter just isn't doing very much. No, it is not wealth. It is not material things that helps the child be nurtured emotionally and spiritually. And Jehovah knew that. Now, Nazareth was a fine place to raise a child. It was peaceful. It was tranquil. It was located in the low mountains of Lower Galilee, surrounded by hills. Yet at the same time, it was not a place of total seclusion. Now, Nazareth was on or near a major trade route. And that meant they were exposed to an influx of the foreigners. The news from throughout the world was brought into Nazareth. And so Jehovah didn't take his little son out into the boonies away from everybody. No, he was raised in what the Bible calls a city. Jehovah had his child raised in a small city. And the fact that Joseph and Mary had to offer up such a meager sacrifice indicates that they must have been a couple of very humble men. After returning to Nazareth, Joseph would resume his trade of carpentry and eventually find a home. He would build tables, he would build benches, he would fix plows. And while he went about his business, what would Mary do? Well, she would follow the normal routine of a Jewish wife, baking bread, shopping, spinning, weaving cloth. But you know what the advantage was of being a housewife? She had time. She had time to work with Jesus, to talk to Jesus, to teach him, to show him how to do little domestic things around the house. Oh, what a pleasure it must have been raising a perfect child. No spanking, no temper tantrum, no measles, no mumps, no colic. What a pleasure it must have been. If Mary went about a daily routine and to give so much attention to this child. Time of the child. If you use all of the things the society has provided to teach, my book of Bible stories, you when you have the time, these things have such a fine effect. As the child grew, Mary and Joseph would begin telling him who he was. Yes, they would have to explain to him that he was really just there on loan. Joseph would teach Jesus carpentry. And as he got older, he would first assist him with chores and then actually master the trade of carpentry. This gave them time to work together, it gave them time to talk. I no doubt Jesus became very close, not just to his mother, but also to his father. Now, you brothers are tied down with secular jobs, and very few jobs these days lend themselves to bringing their children on the job. But evenings and weekends are a good time to be with our children. They teach your sons how to fix the car, to change your flat tire, 
See, this gives you a chance not only to teach him something useful, but kind to talk. And that's what no doubt Jesus and Joseph did. Oh, it wasn't all work. Jesus knew how to play. Even during his ministry, he talked about the way children played in the marketplace. And he no doubt had plenty of playmates. For the Bible indicates that Jesus had four brothers and some sisters. No, Jesus would be no only child or the center of attention. Being in a large family, Jesus had to learn how to share. So even though he never married and had children of his own, Jesus knew what children were like, and he could give so much fine counsel that could help women and children. That's why children felt so comfortable with him. But do you know what made family life in Nazareth so beautiful? It wasn't simply that it was a slow way of life and that Mary and Joseph had time with Jesus. No, the Mosaic law made life spiritual. I remember growing up, my dad was a workaholic. He had a little business. He worked seven days a week. Rarely saw him. And what little time he was home, he was watching football games. But that Mosaic law says you can work six days if you want, but that seventh day is, is for Jehovah. What a marvelous provision that was. Come Friday night as the sundown reached its peak, Mary would hardly finish up fixing the meal. She had to fix enough to last for two days. And then as the sun went down, they would come together and offer God thanksgiving and pray to Jehovah. Then the next day, uh, Mary and Jesus, Joseph rather, would walk Jesus to the synagogue. Jesus would watch his father Joseph step to the front and take his turn at reading a portion of Scripture. All Jews in good standing got to do that. Why, one day he himself would walk to the front of the synagogue and read a portion of Scripture in that very same place and announce that he was the Messiah. Now, did that meeting attendance have an effect on Jesus? Parents, look at what Luke chapter 4, verse 16 says. Luke chapter 4. Luke 4, 16 says, And he came to Nazareth, where he had been reared, and notice this, according to his custom on the Sabbath day, he entered into the synagogue. What does that tell you? His parents had made weekly meeting attendance Jesus' custom, a custom that stayed with him even when he was a grown man. Well, can we learn something from Mary and Joseph? Yes, we learn, number one, keep your material expectations modest. Children don't need material things. They need you. I think of one young woman who's a working woman. She wanted to get into the job market and discover herself. She got her little leather briefcase and her clothing. and She would place her child in daycare. And the little kid would cry. And she'd say, Mommy, what? Daddy, Mommy, rather, why do you have to do this? She said, Mommy works so that you can have violin lessons and go on nice vacations. She said, but Mommy, I'd rather have you. It's not material things that nourish children. It's the attention and affection of their parents. It's building their lives around worship. And so keeping our material expectations modest and making weekly meetings a part of our life is sure to have a profound effect upon our children. Well, the years passed, and under this theocratic environment, Jesus grew. With what effect? The next time we read about Mary and Jesus is recorded in Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. And sisters, note this particularly. It says, now his parents were accustomed to go from year to year to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. Isn't that interesting? Not only did they go to weekly meetings, they also went to the yearly conventions. Now, what's interesting about this is that the law did not require women to go. The law was considered the fact that it's a real hassle taking a bunch of children, going on a long trip to a convention. So it was voluntary. Ah, but Mary went lugging all these children. And ever so many sisters in the congregation do the same thing. We know it's difficult going to conventions with children. Maybe you seem to get very, very little out of the program. But keep going. Be like Mary. Make that long trip to the convention. Deal with the heat. Deal with the lines at the bathroom. You see, because you're instilling lifelong theocratic attitudes in your children. I think of one sister that wrote the Society, and she says, I'm a mother of five. And she said, I already had three children, and then had twins. Well, she read in the Watchtower about a sister that had triplets, 
And she says, when I read that, I didn't feel alone. Yes, Jehovah does help his people because the friends here lovingly help us buy clothes and they help us at the meetings. And she says, I prayed to Jehovah to help us since the children who I took are four to five months old and the friends helped. And we went to the convention and had a nice time. And then she makes this appeal to sisters. She says, I do hope all people who have large families do not think you have to stop service and meetings because with Jehovah's help, we make it. And certainly Mary set a very fine example in from year to year taking all those children that long, long trip down to Jerusalem, 50 miles. Well, verse 42 says, And when he had become 12 years old, they went up according to the custom of the festival and completed the days. But when they were returning, the boy Jesus remained behind in Jerusalem. And his parents did not notice it. Assuming that he was in the company traveling together, they covered a day's distance. And then they noticed, whoops, where is he? Well, you can just sense the, the panic. They began to hunt him up among the relatives and acquaintances. But not finding him, they returned to Jerusalem, making a diligent search for him. Poor Mary must have been in a state of near hysteria. Where was Jesus? Well, there was a custom on certain feast days the teachers or rabbis would come out and they'd keep themselves in the temple arcade, and then people would sit at their feet and ask questions, and that's what Jesus was. And you can well imagine what Jesus was asking them. He, no doubt, was asking about his messiahship. He wanted to learn everything he could. And he probably was finding out that those teachers didn't know too much, but they noticed how smart and bright he was. Well, the Bible account reads in verse 46, well, after three days, they found him in the temple sitting in the midst of the teachers, listening to them and questioning them. Now, just imagine if you had a missing child. It happens. Large families just easily happen, right in our congregation. One large family left their little girl behind. Well, we delivered her. They were very embarrassed, but it happened. And when your child is missing, every bad thought in the universe goes through your mind. Where is he? He's in trouble. He's been kidnapped. He's dead. He's taking drugs. Who knows? And where did they find him? In the temple. Wouldn't you be relieved if your missing child was found in the kingdom hall talking to the elders about the Bible? It would be too good to be true. But notice Mary's reaction. Verse 48. Now when they saw him, they were astounded. And his mother said, Damn child, why did you treat us this way? Here your father and I in mental distress have been looking for you. Notice that expression, mental distress. Now, when you think about it, Mary and Joseph had no real reason to be anxious. They had a perfect child. And yet, as one translation says, your father and I have been worried. Or as the New English Bible says, we have felt great anxiety. Now, young people, there is anxiety raising children, especially in an imperfect world. Now, if the parents of a perfect child suffer mental distress, suffer anxiety. You can be sure that you cause your parents all kinds of anxiety and emotional upset. That's why your parents sometimes drive you crazy. They want to know where you're going to be every waking moment. Where are you going? What time are you coming back? Who are you going to be with? And you go, oh, I'm grown. I'm 12. But Mary viewed their stewardship of Jesus as a sacred assignment, and that's the way your parents view it. And so they're going to hassle you sometimes. They're going to ask, where are you going? Who are you going to be with? And they have a biblical right to do that. Well, sometimes that upset is not warranted, as it was in the case of Mary. Really, they had no reason to be upset. Well, what do you do when your parents get unglued? Perhaps you were supposed to be home by 10 o'clock, you got stuck in traffic, you get home, your parents explode, your father says, we almost called the police. Your mother says, you're grounded for a month. How do you handle that? Handle it like Jesus. Jesus didn't whimper, he didn't cry, he didn't say, oh, stop treating me like a baby. Verse 49 says, but he said to them, why did you have to go looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in the house of my father? Reaction. Utter astonishment. Utter astonishment. Calm, mature, grown-up answer. Really, had they stopped and meditated on it for a moment, they, they could have realized, really, where would he be? They 
Isaiah taught him the truth, where would he be? That should have been the very first thing they thought of. Oh, he must be simply there talking about God's Word. By the way, that little speech Jesus gave had kind of a subtle hint to his parents. See, I must be in the house of my father. See, I'm on loan. You're my parents now and I love you. But my real father is in the heavens. One day I'm going to have to leave you and do the will of my father. And that's no doubt why the next verse says in verse 50, however, they did not grasp the thing that he spoke to them. They didn't get the full implication. Well, if some misunderstanding arises between you and your parents, young people, be like Jesus. Just be calm. Where were you? Where were you? Where have you been? Well, it was a heavy traffic. And uh, we got stuck. It takes the fire out of the situation. Just stay calm, relax. You see, when you whine and scream and holler, it just makes a bad situation worse. Well, if Jesus could subject himself to imperfect parents, should we not be willing to be subject? For verse 51 says, And he went down with them, came to Nazareth, and continued subject to them. What marvelous parents they must have been that this perfect child would be moved to be subject. By the way, this scripture also helps us appreciate a very delicate situation that might affect some here tonight. You see, in the truth, many have very complicated marital situations. And some of us have step families. Some of us may have remarried and we're trying to be a father or a mother to a child that's not our natural offspring. And very often when there's a misunderstanding or tension in the family, that child knows how to say the words that crush you. You're not my father. You're not my mother. And how those words hurt. But did you notice back there in verse 48 that when Mary referred to Joseph, she didn't refer to him as his foster father. She says, here your father and I have been in mental distress. And Jesus didn't challenge that. Day. He's not my father. No, he continued subject to them. So if we're in a family, a step family situation, or a young child, that strange man in the house may not be our flesh and blood father, but he's trying very hard to be a father. And we should be moved to respect that position and be subject to him. Well, the years passed. And interestingly, no further mention is made of Joseph. We can only conclude that he died. And now Jesus was faced with the prospect of caring for his mother, caring for his younger brothers and sisters. No doubt that's why he stayed home until he was 30 years of age, practicing carpentry. But then one day a message comes that John the baptizer is announcing the kingdom and Jesus leaves home. Mary doesn't cry and whimper and use a guilt trip and say, Oh, how could you leave me? How could you do this? No. Mary knew that her work as Jehovah's slave girl was finished. And if she didn't realize it then, it was soon dramatically brought to her attention. It was fall of 29 CE. After his baptism, Jesus returns from Judea and visits that small town of Cana. And John chapter 2 Verse 1 sets the scene. It says, Now on the third day, a marriage feast took place in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there, evidently helping out, serving refreshments, caring for guests. Jesus and his disciples were also invited to the marriage feast. Isn't that something? Jesus wasn't a killjoy. He knew how to have a good time. I remember going to a wedding reception with a friend sat there like this. I said, what is wrong with these people? Suddenly, as if on signal, everybody got up. Some started dancing. People started laughing, having a good time. I wondered, what, what did they put in the punch? I found out later what it was. There was an elder there that the friends felt was so stern and so strict that they felt they had to sit there like this. And when he left, now oh, we can have a good time. Well, brothers, we never want to be so stern and so strict that we feel people can't relax around us. Jesus certainly was not a killjoy. Now in verse 3, a crisis strikes. When the wine ran short, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. There was a saying among the Jews, without wine, there is no joy. And oriental hospitality demanded that there be a superabundance of wine. If not, shame on the family. Well, Mary, involved in ministering to the needs of the guests, was aware of this and brought it to Jesus. But she didn't simply say, they have no wine, conversationally, no. Evidently, Mary raised the pitch of her voice in a way that only a mother can do and said it in a way that implied, they have no wine. 
do something about it. Do something miraculous. Yes, Mary expected a miracle. She had been waiting for 30 years. And now that she knew that Jesus was baptized in Messiah, she wanted to be there and see it. However, Jesus was 30 years old. And here is his mother trying to retain a certain amount of control over him. Mary was grappling with the problem that every single parent here eventually will have to face, the problem of letting go of their children. Because as Jehovah said back in Genesis, a man will leave his mother and his father. And that temptation to meddle, to control, to cling, to hold on to can be pretty strong. Well, Jesus was too smart and too sensitive not to figure out what Mary was trying to do. So we read in John 2, verse 4, But Jesus said to her, What have I to do with you, woman? My hour has not yet come. Now that expression, what have I to do with you, woman? Oh, that sounds awful, doesn't it? The problem is, it's one of those expressions that doesn't translate well. There really isn't anything in English that really conveys it. The idiom evidently conveys the idea is, I don't like what you just said. I don't agree with you. But he called her a woman. Young people, don't try that on your parents. Well, it could be that that word woman is not quite as cold as it seems. Why, even in the German language, that word for woman can mean Mrs. or Madam or Lady. It can be a very respectful term. Jesus was reminding her that now that he was spirit begotten, his real mother was Jerusalem above. That must have hurt Mary. But in as gentle a way as possible, Jesus was saying, Look, don't try to control me. I love you. You've done a lot for me. But from now on, I'm taking my direction from Jehovah. But Mary was a mother. So in verse 5, it says, His mother said to those ministering, Whatever he tells you, do. She didn't give up, did she? In other words, he's going to do a miracle. So whatever he tells you to do, go ahead and do it. She got the point. She didn't take offense. She didn't say, how dare you embarrass me in front of all these people? But at the same time, she was tenacious and determined. This was a very strong-willed woman. Well, it would have been easy for Jesus to be offended and say, what's wrong with you, woman? I told you my hour hasn't come. Are you still trying to boss me around? But Jesus didn't do that. He turned around and performed his first miracle. No doubt he uh, realized that Mary had gotten the last word. But Jesus didn't mind. He knew her, he loved her, and he did not attach wicked motives to her. And he did not allow human pride to get in the way. He performed his miracle. Well, young people and even older people, your parents will always feel a measure of authority over you no matter how old you get. I remember I was given a little job at Bethel that was very responsible. I was an elder and handling uh, telephone calls and letters to the society. I felt like I was sitting on top of the world. Then one day my mother called. And I had a cold. <clears throat> hey, Mom. What's wrong with you? You have a cold. Yeah, it's not bad, Mom. It's just a little cold. Well, she hung up the phone. And within a few hours, there was my mother at the door of Bethel with a bag full of every home remedy for cold. Vinegar and honey, vitamin C, cod liver oil. Well, I'm going to tell you something. We can either fight the love our parents have for us or we can sit back and enjoy it. No, we don't let them control us, but we learn how to let them express their feelings for us and let them express their opinions without getting bent all out of shape. You see, in this life, there will be people that will put up with you. There might even be some people that like you. But aside from your marriage, mate, there is nobody who will ever love you the way that your parents do. And we better respect them. At the same time, though, parents must realize what the psalmist said about raising children. There in Psalm 127, verse 4, he said, The children are like arrows in the hand of a mighty man. Now think about an arrow. You can bend an arrow. You can fiddle with the feathers. You can point an arrow. You can aim it carefully, but once you shoot it, it's gone. Well, we can ruin our children if we unduly interfere in their lives after they're grown and married. We can cause stress and marital problems. We can be their advisors, we can be their helpers, but we cannot be their controllers. So your job as a parent is to be like Mary. 
Do all you can while your children are, are at home to train them and to point that arrow in the right direction. And because you're, you love your children enough to let go of them, you won't lose them. No, the fire of love that you have kindled in their hearts will never die unless you smother it. You can be sure that they'll always care for you and even call you, collect, and even visit. Perhaps not as much as you would like but enough to assure you that they still love and care for you. And just recently, we had a single parent who had so been out of shape over her son getting married. And I told her, don't worry, he'll be calling you, especially when he's short on money. And she came up to me and said, he called me. They don't, they'll never forget you, but we can drive them away if we don't let go. And Mary had to learn how to do that. Evidently, an affectionate bond between Jesus and Mary continued for the rest of his ministry. He didn't take offense. There is no evidence that Jesus said, well, I did that miracle, but I'll never speak to you again. How sad it is in the congregation when people allow petty differences to drive a wall between them and allow the Holy Spirit on the congregation to be restrained. But no, Jesus and Mary were too big for that. Evidence of this is the fact that Mary took a personal interest in his ministry. Matthew twelve forty six indicates that at certain occasions that she tried to follow him. And who did she bring? Matthew 12, verse 46 says, While he was yet speaking to the crowds, look, his mother and brothers took up a position outside seeking to speak to him. So Mary was interested in Jesus' ministry and to the extent possible followed it personally. Notice that she brought his unbelieving brothers. She wasn't about to give up on her children. Although those brothers didn't accept Jesus as the Messiah, she was going to give them all the exposure to the truth she could give them. And ever so many parents very wisely try to expose their children to theocratic youngsters, to full-time servants, to circuit overseers, to Bethel family members, hoping that it will have a good effect. Basically, though, the Bible speaks little of Mary during the whole ministry of Jesus until Passover 33 CE. Mary evidently follows her custom of going to Jerusalem for the festival. But on this Passover, Jesus breaks with the tradition and celebrates not with her and his, his brothers, but with his disciples. And early in the morning, Mary must have received a very disturbing message. Jesus has been arrested and sentenced to death. We know this because at John chapter 19, verse 25, we again encounter Mary. John 19, verse 25. And there it says, By the torture stake of Jesus, however, there were standing his mother. How long Mary had been there, we do not know. The Apostle John, who evidently was with her, described Jesus impaling with such gripping detail, it is obvious that he was an eyewitness. It is possible, though, that John spared Mary the worst, and then went back to fetch her as his last hours approached. On the other hand, it is entirely possible that Mary saw the whole thing. The nails driven into her son's hands and feet. The agonized groans as the stake was viciously jerked upright and the weight of his body came crashing upon his hands and feet. The heaving gasps as the impaled Jesus fought the suffocation of impalement, trying to take a few desperate breaths. What went through the mind and heart of Mary is beyond description. Suddenly, the remembrance of Simeon's prophecy struck her like a bolt of light. Now she understood. Yes, a long sword will be run through the soul of you yourself. And as Mary watched her agonized son, she suffered. Probably only a mother can understand the pain she felt seeing this son whom she had carried and born and given birth to and loved and nurtured dying before her eyes. And as she stood by helplessly. No doubt a hundred things went through her mind. What about all the promises the angels had made? What about the prophecies? What about the years of care and labor she had given him? And what would become of me? What would become of Mary after Jesus was gone? Well, hanging on the stake, Jesus could see her. And in that moment, he put away his own pain and agony. True, Mary had completed her divine assignment. Now she was merely just another one of his disciples. But the sight of Mary standing there touched the soul of the man who hung in agony upon that stake. And there in verse 26, it says, Therefore Jesus, seeing his mother, 
And the disciple whom he loved, standing by, said to his mother, Woman, see, according to John, see, your son, this will be your son. Next he said to the disciple, John, see, your mother, this will be as your mother. And from that hour on, the disciple took her to his own home. Jesus had other brothers who could have cared for his mother, but they did not believe in him. Such being the case, they were unsuitable to be a guardian of his mother. Jesus was concerned not only for her physical welfare, but also for her spiritual welfare. So he chose John, who was a fleshly relative of Mary. Why, John's mother, Salome, was Mary's sister. So what a comfort it would be for Mary to live with her sister, and with her nephew, people that believed in the truth. And ever so many today that have aging parents, perhaps even that need nursing home care, see to it that the spiritual needs of their parents are cared for. Now that Jesus did this for his mother is a marvelous tribute to Mary, a marvelous tribute to a woman who had been so self-sacrificing. And what does this teach us? That no one that gives himself up to Jehovah, no one that sacrifices ever needs worry about his future. There are many old ones in full-time service, traveling brothers, missionaries. Who will care for them in their old age? Jehovah knows. Yes, just as Jesus was sensitive to the needs of his mother, we never need to worry about our old age if we have given ourselves to Jehovah. But yet being cared for in her old age was not the extent of Mary's reward. No, she wasn't simply used and discarded. That's what the world does, but Jehovah doesn't do that to his servant. Acts chapter 1 indicates that Mary got a reward that was beyond her wildest imagining. Acts chapter 1, verse 14. It is Pentecost of 33 CE. 120 disciples have gathered in an upper room. And soon the Holy Spirit would come and endow them with the gifts of the tongue and the promise of living forever in the heavens. And who was there? Verse 14 says, With one accord, all these were persisting in prayer together with some women. And Mary, the mother of Jesus. Yes, she received the heavenly hope. And you notice what the icing on the cake was? And with his brother. For after his resurrection, 1 Corinthians 15, 7 says that Jesus appeared first to whom? To James, his brother. And that convinced him that his brother was the Messiah. James got so excited, he no doubt approached his brothers and said, He is risen. And James became an outstanding member of the congregation along with his other brother, Jude. What a blessing, what a reward to Mary to not only receive the promise of everlasting life, but to see her children receive it. Yet there's no evidence that Mary received any special prominence. She sat there quietly, not as the mother of Jesus, but simply as a member of the congregation. And with this verse, Mary literally disappeared from the Bible record. Never did she seek prominence. Never did she exploit her relationship with Jesus. She was content to serve quietly as Jehovah's slave. Now, how different Mary was from some in the congregation that want to be noticed, that want prominence. Some are willing even to manipulate others, even using their material wealth to gain a certain clout, a certain prominence in the congregation. Some become harsh, imposing their personalities upon the flock. Even sisters fall into this snare. Have you ever heard of the expression elderette? Yes, there are some sisters in the congregation that feel that become their, because their husbands are elders, they have a right to be opinionated, judgmental. I think of one sister that felt she had a divine commission to correct the elders. And if the elders deviated this much, in went a letter to the society suggesting that a special committee be sent in to examine the elders. No, we want to be like Mary. She knew the secret of serving quietly. And she received not only the promise of everlasting life, we can only conclude that she finished her earthly course faithfully and after the year 1918 was raised to the heavens to be reunited with Jesus. And what a reunion that must have been. We might say that Mary was a great woman. What made her great? Was it her privileges? 
Was it the fact that she was the mother of Jesus? Not really. No, Jesus blew that idea right out of the water. For in Luke chapter 11, verse 27, Jesus says this. Luke 11, 27. It says, Now as he was saying these things, a certain woman out of the crowd raised her voice and said to him, Oh, happy is the womb that carried you and the breast that you suck. And it's true. Mary had her privileges. But brothers, privileges of service do not make us great. Titles do not make us great. So Jesus said in verse 28, No. No, that's not what makes us happy. No. Rather, happy are those hearing the word of God and keeping it. What made Mary great was her determination to be Jehovah's slave. Her willingness to do whatever Jehovah told her to do. Brothers, are you willing to be a slave of God? The real happiness, the real joy is out in the field, knocking on doors, helping people, slaving for Jehovah. That's where the joy is. How easy it is to let the American standard of living corrupt our thinking. How easy it is to talk ourselves out of privileges of service. Just today, I talked to a sister that said to me, I had to get on my knees and confess to Jehovah, Jehovah, I love you. I love you 13 hours a month. And she said, I said, I know I should pioneer. I'm single. I have no real responsibilities holding me back, but field service is boring. But no, when she found herself saying, I love Jehovah 13 hours a month, how humiliated she felt. She started rearranging her schedule. She rearranged her life and started slaving for Jehovah. She's able to serve now as a regular pioneer, and she finds joy beyond words. Now, not all of us may be in a position to serve as pioneers or special pioneers, but we can slave for Jehovah. When they ask us to clean the kingdom hall, we can get our hands dirty. When the call goes out for brothers to serve temporarily at Bethel, if we're in a position to do so and have the skills, we can do so. And if we have a family, children, we can slave for Jehovah right there, just as Joseph and Mary did. Why, even Jesus, a perfect child, thrived on love and attention. The brothers, let us slave for Jehovah. What a marvelous example Mary has set in this regard. We do not pray to her. We do not hail her. But we admire her example and we love her. For Mary unhesitatingly said, Look, I am Jehovah's slave girl, putting herself at the complete disposal of the God whom she loves. May we all likewise be moved to do the same, to slave for Jehovah unhesitatingly, unreservedly, unselfishly. And if you do so, you can be sure that like Mary, you will enjoy the blessings of both happiness and everlasting life. For these are the rewards that Jehovah sets in store for those who slave for him.